name is Lauren Carr, and I'm the Director of Education, Engagement, and Inclusion at Ensemble Theatre Cincinnati. And welcome to Meet the Artists. So as you may know, throughout the season, when we have our regularly scheduled performances, on the second and third Thursdays after the performance, we have our Meet the Artists live in our lobby bar. But since we are unable to be in our space, we'd like to bring these conversations straight to you at home, where you're nice and comfortable and safe. Tonight, we have a very special guest, special to me especially. Uh, we have Aaron Carr, who is a movement and intimacy coordinator and theater practitioner. Hello. Hi, Erin. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, as I just mentioned in our, uh, before you joined us in, you are a movement and intimacy coordinator and theater practitioner. So, let's just go ahead and start by breaking that down. So, movement and, intim intim ooh, movement and intimacy coordinator, what does that mean? Great. So, breaking those two words apart, movement. When I work as a movement coordinator, which I've been doing for over 10 years, I work in order to understand how the body exists in space and how we're able to tell a narrative with our gestures and our shape. And how then as a coordinator, how I'm able to help an artist translate that to the back row of the, audio, of the theater. Hmm. As intimacy coordinator, um, Intimacy coordination has luckily become more mainstream and it's becoming more of our vocabulary in our theater world. An intimacy coordinator is an individual who works with a set of exercises and established vocabulary in order to work with the intended narrative to stage the intimacy for a show. Mm, okay, all right, so theater practitioner, can you break that one down for us? Yes, so that is an umbrella term where since working in the world of theater my whole life, um, use theater practitioner as an umbrella term for my work as a actor, as a director, as a creator, as a teaching artist to kind of encompass everything that I do within the world of theater. Cool. So um, if you just could, for those of those people who are watching us tonight who may not know, and I'm very fortunate to know your background. Um, but for everybody else, can you give us a little bit of your background and uh, you know, where you're from. Yes. So I am a Cincinnati, born and raised on the West Side, and lucky enough to be part of an incredible arts family. Um, you may also know our brother, Michael Carr, who is an actor frequently seen on the Ensemble Theater Cincinnati stage. Might have seen him in George McBride. Um, but we come from an incredibly artistic and supportive family, which you also may not know, but our father is an accomplished songwriter, our mom is a costume designer, so very lucky to have that support growing up. My initial training for my undergraduate degree, I went to New York University's Tisch School of the Arts. So while I was there, I studied at the Experimental Theater Wing, working with some of the most incredible, groundbreaking physical theater artists of our time and leading practitioners in conduct improvisation and viewpoints of Grotowski. It was working with these practitioners where I was able to establish my own vocabulary I use when I'm working as a movement coordinator and now as an intimacy coordinator as well. After my undergraduate degree, I moved to Philadelphia. I started my first theater company, Revamp Collective, a feminist-centric theater company based on intersectional feminism on the stage, in the work, and behind the scenes, working to make sure that the voices who have not had a chance to be heard could have a seat at the table. Since then, I have moved back to Cincinnati. And while I have been in Cincinnati working as an actor, as a creator, as a director, teaching artist, and Recently also co-founded Solasta Theater Lab, a physical theater company working on impulse into action through movement work and puppetry. I also travel around the US teaching this work for high schools, universities, and corporations as well. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Just a bit. So uh, talking about movement and intimacy in particular, how did you get into this work? Well, I have personally been working as a movement life coach and a body language consultant um, for the past 10 years. Mm. It's through this work that I have been able to use some of the physical vocabulary that I mentioned from within my training, mm -hmm. um, such as core contact, of establishing core contact anytime I'm staging a moment within movement. So that's kind of been my basis of movement training, movement work, um, getting me into the work of coordination. I've also been fortunate to been to work with the Society of American Fight Directors, and Cincinnati is an incredible fight city. And so working here, living here, I've had the chance to work with some of the 
best fight choreographers and fight masters here in Cincinnati um, of my career. And so through fight choreography and through that fight training, the book, the work and establishment that's done in fight, fight choreography, that you're separating the action and the emotion of understanding that it is a set piece of choreography. The actors aren't changing it every night. You're not picking up a new weapon. You are setting your, you're working with that set choreography. Mm. So that training from fight choreography is the same that's wor used in intimacy work because within that we also separate the emotion and the action to understand the story the action is saying rather than the internal emotions. Okay. So um, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, this is Erin Carr. She's a movement and intimacy coordinator and a theater practitioner. And this is Ensemble Theater Cincinnati's Meet the Artists. Um, so for those who just, you know, we see your name in the playbill and we, we see this title underneath it, and we have seen intimacy listed as, as choreographer as well, but what is the difference between a choreographer and the work that you do with movement and intimacy? Great question. So a choreographer would be a incredible talented artist who is designing and directing the movement of where someone is moving and what dance moves they might be doing or what they're doing with their body. A coordinator, I'm coming in to help on the how of how is someone moving from point A to point B. So working with Ensemble, actually this past holiday season on Frog Princess, Deanne Brill, working as choreographer, worked with Brooke Steele, who's playing our lead Frog Princess, in how she would be dancing and the dance moves that were given to her. Mm -hmm. I was then coming in, I came in then to work with Brooke on how she was moving as a frog to make sure that she was staying safe. Mm -hmm. And similarly, if you had the chance to see the show, of working with Lisa De Roberts as the bird, Burgess Bird as the bear, Sarah Mackey as the fish, and to make sure that the physical narrative that they were intending to tell was indeed translating to the back of the audience. Cool. So then you're working in tandem with the director or the choreographer. Yes. It is incredibly important to make sure that you are, as you said, working in tandem. It's part of the production team coming in at the pre-production meetings, being part of the team to making sure that everyone is on the same page and understanding what I'm doing as I'm coming into the room. I had an incredible time working with Deanne and understanding how I was able to help her and how I can then use her work as well. Awesome. So why do we need this? Why, why do theaters, why does film, why do we need this work? How long do we have? <laughs> so, um, as everyone hopefully understands, it is important for every single human being to feel safe in their workplace, physically, emotionally, and mentally across the board, not just in the workplace, you should feel safe and understand that consent is part of that. So an intimacy coordinator comes in to work on that specific production of bringing in their set exercises, as I mentioned, which can include rituals of engagement for the artist involved in a sensitive scene to make sure that they're establishing a tapping in and a tapping out protocol and exercise or ritual that works best for them. Mm -hmm. of making sure that the entire cast, the entire team is on the same page with communication, with uh, vocabulary that everyone feels comfortable with, specifically the artist, the vocabulary the artists feel comfortable with, and the physical action that the artists feel comfortable, comfortable with, mm -hmm. and making sure that the action that's being told is not gratuitous, making sure that the physical narrative is within everyone's boundaries and the playwright's intention as well. I'm there through, from pre-production, my intimacy coordinator pre-production all the way to closing night of checking in with the artists to making sure that they're still feeling safe and making sure that the choreography is still feeling comfortable and also checking in with the stage manager to make sure as i said the choreography hasn't changed mm. make sure that it is established as as that choreography so it's that idea of consent is imperative in all cultures but especially um especially within theater with any script. Oh, fun. So uh, what may be some of your favorite shows that you've worked on at uh, Ensemble Theater Cincinnati? Well, going down the list. As a movement coordinator, I had this, actually, this time last year, we were working on The Wolves. 
And I was lucky enough to come in to work, oh, <laughs> work on the Wolves with this incredible cast of artists in order to create an ensemble physical vocabulary that they were using throughout the show and to introduce awareness, kinesthetic response, so that way all artists were on the same page. And of course, as I mentioned, most importantly, to make sure that they were being safe with their body. And I said, translating that narrative, that physical narrative with their entire body from, from the stage to the back of the audience. So as a movement coordinator, that was a wonderful experience working on this new show. And then this past season with the opening show of Fun Home, I had an amazing time with the entire cast. I had an amazing time working with the entire cast from any points of contact. Everyone understood the work, but specifically working with Charlie Clark and Max Myers. Because what was interesting working on their scene is that there actually isn't a moment of physical contact that we were playing with. And so it really was establishing that conversation that intimacy isn't necessarily physical contact. There are many realms of intimacy and intimacy is defined by each individual. Thus it's, make, it's important for theater companies to have a conversation with their artists that they're bringing in as well. And so thinking about that space that was between the two actors, and as we all know right now, how important space is. So playing with that space as intimacy. Yeah. So those are two of my favorite recent experiences. Um, I'm gonna kind of jump around a little bit because we have some really great, great questions coming in. So we have a question uh, that is, can you give us an example of this type of ritual? So you mentioned the rituals that you, know, you work on with the actors. Yes. Um, some of the rituals that I will either establish or that actors will establish might be a specific high five. So if both of them raising their hands and high fiving one another, making full on, making eye contact with each other and then relaxing their body and doing that same physical movement before, either before their intimacy call, which is set before the show, mm -hmm. um, as well as before the show and also after the show as a closing ritual. Mm. Our body understands that type of routine. And so the more that your body is able to go through a repetitive motion, understanding we're about to go into another situation and we're both on the same page and we're both communicating that we are feeling safe with one another. Um, so uh, we have a question from Lisa of uh, what are some examples of the set vocabulary that you have used? Breaking down what each person's idea of consent is. So it, for, it varies truly on each show. I will talk, I'll have a one-on-one -on -one or working with an ensemble as a whole, depending on each artist's comfortability or how comfortable they're feeling and asking what words that they feel comfortable with when we are talking about the staging, when we're talking about the choreography um, and making sure that we all understand what that word consent means, understanding they have any point they're able to say no and what no means to each person and what yes means to each person. Mm -hmm. So kind of breaking down what we would say essentially social norms to truly make sure that everyone's on the same page. Now, earlier when you and I were kind of uh, talking about what we'd be talking about tonight, you had this amazing story about consent. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, uh, well, as I mentioned, I so working as a movement coordinator and a movement teaching artist for over 10 years, when I've been working as a teaching artist, I've worked with artists of all ages. So I do this work from ages five to 80. So my favorite moments actually of introducing and teaching consent is with the younger age groups. Mm. Working with the five-year-olds, we'll be working on a scene and it might be that'll be working on stage pushes or comment pushes or a stage hug and making sure that every single one of them understands that you are not able to make physical contact with someone unless you've been given consent. Mm -hmm. And at any point, if someone asks you if they can make contact, you can always say no, whether it's me as a teacher, whether it's another peer. And just because someone said yes for previous exercise doesn't mean they, that that yes still is implied. So of establishing that they will always ask, may I make contact before a combat push or a stage hug, what I love and it's incredibly endearing in a wonderful, wonderful way is that during a lot of times during the show, you'll actually see the five and six year olds pause before that push or before that hug and whisper to the other actor, may I make contact? Mm -hmm. And then they will wait for the other actor to respond. During their performance. They do. During their performance. During, during the performance. Under their parents. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm, and, I mean, I'd much rather of, of teaching what consent means for each individual at a younger age and understanding what physical movement, the story you're telling at that age too. That's amazing. Uh, we've got a really great question from Carolyn. Carolyn asks, what happens when the artistic vision of a playwright 
or director competes with the actor? That is a wonderful question. Yeah. Or, okay, actor's boundary. Okay. It's a great question, I'm breaking it apart. Amazing for myself. Always making sure if you're, especially, I'm gonna talk first with the director mm -hmm. and the actors. Um, so I think the playwrights write different, we'll get, I'll first start with directors and the actors. So with a director, one of the things that I will talk about and work with the director is to understand what is their intention of that staging? Is it gratuitous? Is there, what is the reason of that movement? So to understand that intimacy, as I mentioned with Fun Home, intimacy can be expressed through all, so, through so many different forms. So making sure it, that it is intended and it is necessary. Mm -hmm. um, but first and foremost, it does come to the actor's boundaries of making sure how are the actors feeling comfortable. And if an actor has agreed to a show, they've read the script, they know what is intended. Mm -hmm. However, what's incredibly important and why intimacy coordinator is there is because although they might've read the script and they understand that there's a point of contact, they're not agreeing to how that contact is being staged or how that contact is being directed. Mm -hmm. So intimacy coordinator is there to make sure that it is similar to fight choreography. It is set, it is safe, it is staged. And it is a, it's a conversation, Carolyn as well, of a conversation ideally between the playwright, play, the director and the artists. All right, that's, I mean, something right. that, you know, right. we have, something we haven't really talked about, right? So mm -hmm. if the playwright has written in a scene, but the director may come in with a vision of that scene being something different, the actor may have read the script and seen the playwright's vision, but doesn't necessarily know the director's vision yet. And that's where you come in to kind of bridge that gap. Yes. Huh. So, put. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no, I'm just kind of processing as we're going. Uh, so for those of you who are just joining us, my name is Lauren Karn. I'm the Director of Education, Engagement, and Inclusion at Ensemble Theatre Cincinnati. And I have with me tonight, Erin Carr, who is a Movement and Intimacy Coordinator, Theater Practitioner, and my sister. I had to throw it in there somewhere. I just, I was like, it was gonna happen at some point. Just had to throw that in there. Very proud over here. So, you know, might as well go ahead and use that. So, um, what are some challenges that you may have faced in this work or that people tend to face in this work? What Carolyn brought up with that question is exactly one of the biggest challenges, specifically the conversation to have with the entire production team and with the director. So that those, the problems might come up due to generational divide or a misunderstanding of the work. Mm. So it's incredibly important in order for all directors, all artists to educate themselves on these pillars, on this work, on this codified system of intimacy coordination. Um, so they can do that by training with several of the different incredible organizations. There are so many individuals and organizations that have worked hard and dedicated themselves, themselves to codify this work, to make sure that it is prevalent and present in works on Broadway and Hollywood. Um, even the SDC, Stage Directors and Choreographers um, Society, mm -hmm just recently posted an article about intimacy coordination for directors to understand the importance of the work. So I think it's, the challenge has been when the misunderstanding, and I would say the lack of communication. Um, so that's where directors, I encourage all directors, all artists to, if you're not familiar with this work, to find training within it. And uh, so where, what different organizations would you refer them to? Definitely, I would say the three organizations that always come to mind, in his intimacy directors and coordinators have here theatrical intimacy education and if you are abroad there's team idi team in, um, <laughs> intimacy directors international uk just to name a few but all of those creators are brilliant in their work so we have a question from victoria what advice can you give to performers to advocate for themselves in productions when an intimacy coordinator is not present? That's a great question. Yes. Um, wonderful question, Victoria. Similarly, more that actors are able to understand what an intimacy coordinator does, the more that they can advocate for themselves with that vocabulary, with those words of understanding, great, why is this moment of contact necessary? Mm -hmm. In the similar way of if a director were to say to someone, and now you're going to have a fight, why? In musicals, we sing because words aren't enough to express those emotions. And then during fight scenes, we fight because words are not enough. And so similarly, there's moments of intimacy because words are not enough. 
So breaking down and just establishing that as the norm of during your um, during your script work, analysis, character work, of asking, great, why is this moment necessary? And then establishing your boundaries. So understanding as an artist what you feel comfortable with physically and taking that self-awareness for yourself, to, using that self-awareness in the room for yourself. So uh, we have another question that is, when did this role of intimacy coordinator begin to emerge in the theater world? And I wanna kind of add on to that of, why did it take us so long? Oh. <laughs> I love these questions. Okay. And, and, these are, and, these are, and these are the conversations that we need to be having. Mm -hmm. um, the role of intimacy coordination say, began to reemerge in the public eye and for, for theater mainstream in 2017. Um, but there have been several artists for the past decade where working through using this language. I myself have used, as I mentioned, the language of consent, of communication, of having a ritual, and all of my work as a movement coordinator for the past 15 years, not just the past 10 years working specifically as a movement coordinator. Um, but luckily within these organizations and these companies that these individuals have really established this work for the past four years. Mm. So but why? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Is... There, I know that, um, that a lot of things that have happened socially in our culture for the past, that have come to public eye in the past four years, mm -hmm. four or five years um, that have been maybe not talked about. So luckily because we have people and individuals have started to speak up about where their boundaries are in life as humans, as since theater does reflect life on stage, luckily, the theater world has been able to answer to a necessary need as well to making sure that artists feel comfortable on stage. All right. And so one of the things that you and I have kind of talked about, um, and I am definitely getting back to some of these questions, but that this work really transcends theater. It's a, it transcends film, yes. right? other types of performance, because I had the question asked me, you know, does this apply to ballet, to opera? You know, I think there's so many other venues. Everything. In the same way that any organization, any company would never move forward without an HR department. Mm -hmm. No theater company or no artistic production should be without an intimacy coordinator on staff or on production. As I mentioned, intimacy is defined by what the artist and artist being in every form of art, of how they define it. So an intimacy coordinator is there to making sure that one artist, as I said, for one person holding a hand might not be intimate, for another it could be extremely intimate. So making sure that an intimacy coordinator is there in all art, in all art forms. So we have a great question from Daniela. It says, can you talk a little bit about intimacy work in productions where other cultures, other than American, are present and how American theater works better on cultural diversity? I love these questions. These are amazing. Great. Um, yes, well, I, I think it comes down to, once again, the thing we don't have enough of, of communication, of listening first, before speaking, so listening to understand how a specific culture might express a form of um, a form of intimacy, and asking that artist or asking people of that culture for um, examples, for, and especially for them to be in the room, wanting to make sure that they are present, um, and having that conversation, listening, learning, and doing research. I, mean, I think as artists, we're consistently, we're constantly learning and trying to understand the world and understand how we can better ourselves. And that is definitely a great question, a great thing for all artists to be able to do. Oh, we've got some really great people watching tonight. It's really nice to uh, hear. So again, for any of us who have just joined us, my name is Lauren Carm, the Director of Education, Engagement and Inclusion at Ensemble Theater Cincinnati. And this, I'm joined tonight with Erin Carr, Movement and Intimacy Coordinator. Um, and so Erin, what are you up to right now? I mean, we are in this unprecedented times, right? As we all know, this is something, it's amazing. It is truly a global event, right? No one is unaffected by what is going on right now. So what are you, what are you doing? What are you up to? <laughs> How much time do we have again? Um, so 
as a as I mentioned, as a theater practitioner, there's many things that fall underneath that umbrella. I am currently creating a and devising a physical ensemble piece that will be streamed digitally to be announced at a later point. Um, I also work, as I mentioned, as a body language consultant doing one-on-one -on -one lessons with individuals, artists or non-artists to understand the physical narrative that they're telling um, and how it's translating and if it's translating in, in their intended manner. Um, and in order to translate the work of physical theater across different mediums, I've really been working for the past month to break down any of my training and the work that I, that I teach and the work that I work in um, as an artist to use those building blocks and create audio files and video um, platforms in order to make this work a little bit more digestible in a different format. Um, but also, I mean, as we mentioned, space exploring how we're, how space and spatial relationship and spatial distance is going to be shifted, how contact is going to be shifted um, going forward. And we do have a great comment that just came in, just a little comment that you actually also worked with a synchronized swimming team? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. How was that? How did yes. that go? It was, as I mentioned, of working with that physical narrative. I love, I mean, we tell stories with our bodies in every single medium. It's wanting to make sure that A, we're telling the story we intend to tell as a human going into an interview, as an artist on stage, and also to make sure that we're feeling comfortable in our body as we're telling that story. And making and comfortable comes down to being safe. So making sure that you are physically safe as well as mentally safe telling that story with the shape of your body. Working with the synchronized swim team of Cincinnati was an incredible opportunity to talk about what is being seen versus what is not and how everything is part of that story. Yeah, I think that was one of the really interesting things uh, with, with your work with the actors in The Wolves was that while they were do maybe be doing a, uh, a lunge or a crunch or you know the different exercises and workout things that they were doing, the importance of the rest of their body and how that translated. Yes. I mean, right now, I'm as if anyone who's worked with me, I'm activating my tailbone, being aware of my spine, understanding my feet on the ground. That even though this is all that people are seeing, every part of my body is invested in every single movement. And so, with the wolves, it was similar of working with understanding how their right foot influenced and changed the way that their left foot was moving, their shoulder blades, their head, hips, all working together as one. That's amazing. So uh, you are working on translating your physical theater movement work online, which is just mind blowing to me. I'm I'm trying to figure out how to you know present myself online, much less uh, physical theater work. And I know that you're still teaching because you yes. are you mentioned you're a teaching artist. So I know that you teach with uh, Miami University. Yes. And um, I think you're working with CCM as well right now. Yes, I was. Yes. Um, so what is, uh, just, you know, as we're kind of wrapping up, what's one thing that you could, bit of advice that you could give to everybody, not only for right now as we are all, you know, understanding the new abnormal world that we are entering into, uh, but when they are on stage or in a film or, you know, what is that parting words of e-wisdom you would like to, to drop on them? Listen to yourself so you know what to communicate and how to communicate it. Take the time to understand that the person on the receiving end might not be using the same vocabulary that you're intending to get across, mm -hmm. so patience. But the more that you can understand yourself and where you're comfortable, as I mentioned those boundaries, but also how you're using your body, um, the more that you're going to have those words to translate to a director or to your audience in any format. Awesome, well, Erin, thank you so much for joining us. I very much appreciate you here with me today. And clink, clink. Um, I thank you so much for Erin. It's really great to have our Movement Intimacy Coordinator uh, here with us on Meet the Artist. So for all of you watching, next week, uh, we are very excited. We have the one, the only, the incomparable Todd Allman. We are so excited. You may have seen him on our stage in I Am My Own Wife or in Hedwig in the Angry Inch. We are so excited that we will have Todd with, joining us next week. And the week after that, do not think that we are done. Our Meet the Artist series will continue. And we will have a special announcement for you on who that will be coming out soon. So be on the lookout. Check out ETC's Facebook and Instagram and YouTube for constant content and things that we've got coming just for you all. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you.